Hi folks, I'm Chris Marshall with Woodworkers Journal Magazine, and this handsome little arts and crafts inspired bookcase appears in our February 2013 print issue. It's got classic styling that'll enhance almost any decor, and it only takes about 20 board feet of lumber to build it. And you can make it with ordinary benchtop power tools like these. This video will give you a quick overview of the general construction process, but it's designed to be a companion to the print article, which provides the measured drawings, material lists, and other important construction notes. Before we get started building our bookcase, I wanted to take a few moments to talk about stock selection for the legs. Now you know from the print article that I'm suggesting you use Rifson stock for the legs. That's R-I-F-T, where the growth rings run roughly diagonally through the thickness of the lumber, as opposed to quarter sawn where the growth rings are perpendicular. Now here's why rift sawn is better. Here I've got a piece of quarter sawn white oak. I put some stain on it. And of course the face grain exhibits that beautiful ray flake pattern that we all want. But the problem with quarter sawn is that its edge grain is actually flat sawn. And you see these real strong demarcations between the early wood and the late wood. Now the fact that we're laminating two thicknesses together to make our legs means that edge grain is going to be really pronouncedly different from the face grain. And chances are the flat grain between the two laminations is not going to line up. So the glue lines are really going to stand out. Now over the long haul, that's probably not a look you're going to be real happy with. Now in contrast, here's a leg blank that I've glued up from Rifson stock. Now face grain Rifson is not going to exhibit that same beautiful ray flake pattern or at least not as strongly so. But it does have a real consistent linear grain pattern. And the advantage is, so does the edge grain. You really can't see much of a difference between face grain Rifson and edge grain Rifson. And with two glued up laminations put together, that linear grain pattern really helps hide the glue line. In fact, it really doesn't look like you've glued it together at all and your legs are going to look like they're made from single pieces of stock, which ultimately is what you want anyway. So Rifson is definitely the way to go for these legs. Now any supplier that sells quarter sawn white oak is also going to have Rifson stock. You just have to look a little more carefully for it, but it's definitely worth it for this project. So with that said, let's get started. Face glue two wide boards together for the leg stock. When the glue cures, rip the four legs to rough width Square them up and cut the legs to final length. Arrange the legs together, marking which faces you'll want to see from the front and sides. Orient the glue seamed faces to the sides and solid faces to the front and back. There's a good deal of mortising to do on these legs. Five mortises each in either one half inch or three eighths inch widths depending on the joint. Carefully lay out the mortise locations on a front and back leg. Then transfer corresponding mortise layouts to the other set of legs. Remember, the front and back leg pairs are mirror opposites, not duplicates of one another. Double check your accuracy before setting up your router table to begin the milling process. Mark your router fence to identify the outer edges of the bit, then mill the mortises in a series of drop cuts against the fence to reach the final mortise depth of one half inch. Cut all the half inch wide mortises first before switching to a 3 8 inch diameter bit to cut the narrow side rail mortises. Square up the ends of all the mortises with sharp chisels. Now you can head to the table saw to cut pyramid tops on the legs. First attach a very long fence to your miter gauge so you can clamp a stop block to the far end to register the leg bottoms accurately. Tilt your saw blade to 18 and a half degrees and make a curve cut through the fence to help position each of the four beveled cross cuts that form each pyramid. These beveled cuts start one quarter inch down from the tops of the legs. Be sure to use a sharp blade to minimize splintering and tear out. Set the legs aside and cut the four side rails to size next. Now we're ready to cut the tenons on the ends of our side rails, but be careful when laying them out. They're not centered on the thickness of these parts. The inside shoulders are a quarter of an inch, but the end shoulders and outside shoulders are just an eighth of an inch. That gives us an offset. In that wider shoulder, we'll sit the rails flush with the inside faces of the legs. Cut these half inch long tenons on your table saw supported by the miter gauge. 
Remember to change the blade height accordingly when cutting the two different shoulder sizes. A test piece cut first is always a good fail safe in these situations. Use a block clamped to your rip fence to index the tenon lengths when making these cuts. When the tenons are finished, mark and drill three 5 16 inch diameter holes on what will be the top or bottom edges of the side rails. These holes are for the dowel pegs that will fix the accent styles in place. Now cut the six accent styles from sticks of 5 8 inch square stock. Drill one and one 16 inch deep holes into both ends of each style. Gang clamp the styles together several at a time in your doweling jig to hold them squarely and evenly while you drill the centered holes. Next, cut 12 dowel pins from a 5 16 inch diameter rod and chamfer their ends to make them easier to tap into their holes in the side rails and accent styles. A mark on your miter saw's fence can register the lengths of these dowels quickly and accurately. Now you're ready for some assembly, and here's a few tips. Start by gluing your accent styles and side rails together with dowel pins and let those assemblies dry. But before you start gluing everything up, sand your dowel pins for an easy push fit in their holes. You don't want to have to hammer these parts together. With the dowel pins slightly loose, you'll still be able to rotate these accent styles if you need to, to square them up with the side rails before the glue sets. Then when you glue the legs and rails together, Position the clamps on the insides of the sub-assemblies where the rails and legs are flush. That'll direct the clamping pressure right over the mortise and tenon joints, and it'll help to keep this plane between the rails and the legs flat. While your side assemblies dry in the clamps, you can move on to making the three back stretchers. Now the tenons are a little bit unusual on these parts as well. The stretcher's half-inch thick tenons have an eighth-inch wide shoulder on the top, a quarter inch wide shoulder in the back, and a half inch deep, three quarter inch wide rabbit along the bottom edge. This tongue will serve as an attachment point for the back edges of the shelves. And remember, the top back stretcher is wider than the other two because it will receive the cloud lift shape. Be sure to cut the tenons on the top back stretcher first while you still have the full flat edges intact. When you cut the stretcher tenons, make the bottom rabbit cuts last as they remove a lot of material. Raise the blade to one half inch and cut the waist away in several passes, resetting the rip fence to widen the rabbit with each pass. Once the tenons are rough to size, lay out and cut the cloud lift shapes and their adjacent flats along the top edge of the top back stretcher. Smooth these cuts and curves carefully with a file and sandpaper or use an oscillating spindle sander if you have one. Now rip and cross cut the three front shelf supports to size. You can also make their half inch tenons, which are centered conventionally on the ends of the supports. They're not offset like other tenons in this project. Carry out a full dry assembly of the bookcase frame, then glue and clamp the six cross supports between the bookcase sides. Check the alignment of the cross supports once the tenons are installed in their mortises. Apply a long clamp across each pair of joints to pull the framework together. Be sure to check the clamped up assembly for square before the glue sets. While the framework joints dry, edge glue some quarter sawn stock for the three shelves. Plane the shelf blanks to final thickness, then rip and cross cut them to final size. Round their outer front corners with half inch radii to add an attractive detail. You can shape these by hand with files and sandpaper or use a disc sander. Once you give the shelves a final sanding, stain and finish the bookcase framework and shelves. We use satin lacquer sprayed from aerosol cans as a top coat. When the finish dries, drive five countersunk flathead wood screws through the tongues of the back stretchers and into the back edges of the shelves to pin them in place. Follow this with three or four one and a half inch long countersunk wood screws driven up through the front shelf supports into the shelves to secure them in front. And that wraps up construction on this project. I hope you enjoy building it and thanks for watching.